Hey, what's up, everybody? On this week's Sport Life Podcast, we sit down with high school softball coach and former high school softball star Peyton Day. She's a two-time state champion, and her senior year, she actually won the Eyes Up Do the Work scholarship from Especially for Athletes because she did such a great job of exemplifying the E4A principles in her life. She has great insights from both the perspective of a player, a coach, and now a high school biology teacher. It is a wonderful listen. We know you'll enjoy it. Welcome to the Sportlight Podcast for parents, coaches, and athletes. The Sportlight refers to the time in an athlete's life when they have increased ability to affect the culture around them and the increased opportunity to learn life's lessons through sports. This podcast aims to help parents and coaches capitalize on their athletes' precious time in the Sportlight. The Sportlight Podcast is brought to you by Especially for Athletes program. Well, Peyton, how are you? Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm great. How are you doing? Doing so good. It's an honor to have you. We're excited to talk to a softball player and to learn some of these life lessons through sports through the eyes of, of someone who played at a high level in softball. And like we said in the intro there, you're a two-time state champion at Spanish Fork High School, right? Yeah. And, uh, yeah. mm-hmm. and your freshman and sophomore year, you you went deep into the playoffs, but you really, your team finished it off as a junior year yep. and senior year player. So congratulations. All of us want to be state champs, but not many of us get to do it. That must have been fun. Yeah, it was definitely up there in the memories that I'll remember forever. So yeah. Cool. And and here in Spanish Fork, they put you on a, they drive you back to town, put you on a fire truck and then do a parade for you down down main street take us to that moment what did that feel like after all that hard work your whole life probably played with a lot of these girls your whole life and so you've been working toward this and then all of a sudden you're on the top of the fire truck and you're a state champion and you're going down main street of spanish fork with everyone cheering you on tell us how that felt yeah, even to back it up just a little bit, my junior year, we had um, one state and we played in an earlier game. Um, we had actually played against a cross town rival of Maple Mountain and um, had a walk off home run. So that was like, you know, just cherry on top win. That was so cool. We went to dinner or lunch as a team. And then we had went to the baseball game that was they were playing Maple Mountain in the state championship at UVU. And, you know, girls sports, we don't get quite as many fans to, in comparison. And we'd walked into the stadium, the game stopped and everyone stood up and were clapping and we we're kind of looking around like, what, did someone just, you know, do something, make a big play? And it was for us. So that was that was a pretty cool. And then they ended up um, our baseball team won it as well. So we got to ride down the fire trucks together and it was it was one of the best parade. It was the best parade I've ever been to. So uh, that was really cool. Yeah, that is really cool. How awesome to walk into a stadium and have everyone stop and start clapping for you. And I, I actually, Peyton, I was there. I now yeah. I remember that. I love taking in the high school baseball championships, and I still remember that when you guys came in, and that was a really cool moment. And then to have both of your teams win the state championship, that's that's yeah. a great tribute to yeah, the community. Cool. Yeah, it was awesome. Well, awesome. Well, we want to get into some of the lessons of that you've learned from sports. And yeah, now absolutely. you're a teacher at Dixie High and and you've been a softball coach there, as we said in the intro. And but now you're taking on the greatest challenge in life, and that's gonna be being a mother yes. due with a baby girl in in November. Is that yeah. right? Right after Thanksgiving. How mm-hmm. cool. And so so you're gonna step away a little bit and someone else is gonna coach the the softball team and you'll be providing all the support and strength and conditioning and things yep. like that. And so but you've had experience as a player and as a coach, and we're just really excited to learn some of the lessons that have stuck out to you the most. And and so I wanted to start off with that. Just when you think of your sports life, playing softball, all growing up and and then coaching softball, and what are some of the greatest lessons that you've learned from your experiences playing softball? 
Yeah, sports, I will say, like changed the course of my life and really shaped me to who I am today. At a young age and a really pivotal age for young women, um, I was um, 13, 14 years old, and um, I had the opportunity to try out for a high caliber softball team. And they were kind of, it was a branch out of Arizona, but they went to tryouts and there were like 50 girls. And I just looked around and I was like, I don't even stand a chance. Like I don't belong here, but I had, you know, been taught to give it a hundred percent. I was like, hustle was my number one thing always. Um, and that I would not be out hustled. I was going to out hustle everyone there. And I had got a call back that I had made the team, which Hmm. looking around, it was, it was super surprising to me. Um, but they saw my, those coaches saw potential and belief in that and saw my work ethic. But from that team, the biggest thing that I really got was self-confidence um that it was good to be strong and be fast with girls there's so much pressure for body image and how you should be a certain way or what you should kind of be a part of and um from that team just the i look back on those experiences and just the the confidence in myself and the belief in myself that really was developed through putting myself in hard hard situations and working through um, that that's really got me through those pivotal years of being a young woman. So can I go to that for a second? Because as we've talked with, with women athletes and girl athletes, this concept of, of body image is something that seems to come up a lot. And I think as guys who it, it doesn't, I don't, we've never heard it come up. I've yeah. never heard the word body image in one interview that we've done with a male. But it seems to me that, that was that something that you had like questioned and struggled with? And then all of a sudden, it was like, okay, I'm I'm a tall, fast, strong girl. And was that something that it sounds to me like your try out there where you realized like, wait, this is a good thing. Did I read that yeah. correctly in your answer? Yeah, Would you tell me more about great. that? So, um, it wasn't, I wouldn't say necessarily something that I like had really struggled with. Cause I know that there are um, some who have really had those struggles and, and I was lucky to kind of have that belief from my parents as well, you know, that you're like strong and beautiful, but really when I, was able to like apply myself, work hard when I started lifting weights and going to acceleration training to really do that, that it was that my body was really like a gift and a tool. And I really appreciated it. And it helped me learn how to take care of it. Um, And I learned that through sports. And it's something that with, um, as a coach, I try and like reiterate over and over and over again, that you need to take care of yourself. You need to take take care of your bodies. You need to fuel it right. You need to, you know, recover and and those things that it is um, can change that mindset where some might have a really negative um, outlook on that. Yeah. Well, thank you for for bringing yeah. that up. It just mm-hmm. seems to come up a lot. And and I love what you said. What do you tell your girls like? Let's say you had a girl, I'm sure you've had this at at Dixie High or your teammates as you were as you were playing that what would you tell a girl who loves sports, loves athletics, is having a hard time with body image right now? What would you say to a girl? Um, just kind of along those lines of that your body is the tool to get you to have these experiences. And um, they kind of joke with me that I go biology teacher on them because I'll start talking about, you know, like muscle fatigue and lactic acid fermentation and different like macromolecules that we need to really rebuild those muscles and how to fuel and, but just giving them that information and the tools to 
understand what makes their body work Mm -hmm. um, where they're like why they might be feeling this fatigue um and it's like well you you're starving yourself cutting these calories isn't healthy for you especially as an athlete um and and things like that where it's like if you eat in the right balances and you're working out how you need to be that um and it will also it can translate into when you're done with sports because there's going to be a time when you're going to hang up the cleats and you're no longer going to be working out practicing for three four hours a day um that you've got to learn these habits and how to take care of your body now so that it can create like a healthy lifestyle later yeah that's awesome great great lesson from sports any other any other lessons that came to mind when you think of that like your time playing softball and coaching softball any other lessons that particularly stick out to you that have benefited you in your life now as you're moving on preparing to be a mom and a coach and a teacher and and all of those things yeah um i mean obviously the topic of work ethic and hard work comes up but one of the biggest things that one of the core principles of especially for athletes of resilience that really is again so translatable to the rest of life um that they're Again, it's going to be a time when you're no longer an athlete, but there's going to be time and time again when things don't go your way, and it's how you react to it. Um, It's the attitude that you had towards decisions that are made by others and what you decide to do with it, and um, that was one of the key things that like has shaped me that I learned from my time as an athlete yeah we had mason sawyer on he's from down there actually you may know his story and uh, lost his family in a in a car accident and he said that the lou holtz quote was what his high school coach used to always share with him that life is 10 percent what happens to you and 90 percent how you respond that i i just heard that in your your aunt. sports teaches you that right there's going to be bad calls there's going to be unfair things that happen or people that cheat on a play or or whatever and you just that happened now you choose how you respond to it right exactly Mm -hmm. awesome awesome so i um i wanted to ask you you've had some great coaches uh spanish fork is a perennial powerhouse here in utah I don't know how many years in a row now they've won the state championship, but they've either played for it or won it. I mean, it feels like every year for a decade here. Yeah. Um, what are some of the things that your coaches did or that your parents did that really helped you as a young athlete that you would like coaches and parents who listen to this podcast to know like, hey, here's some of the things that I think really made an impact on both my athletic career, but also with me as a person. Yeah, I think um, especially becoming a a coach and having a short coaching career so far, just learned to really appreciate the coaches that I've had so much more than when I was an athlete. And, And same thing with my parents too. You realize how much they sacrificed and did for myself and just the opportunities that they provided i'll i'll kind of start with my parents and you know from a young age taught work ethic being coachable having respect for authority um that it's and then also self-reliance with a lot of things um that if coaches decisions were made that they weren't the ones in the coach's office or showing up at practice to talk to them that it was really up to me as an athlete like okay what do you need to do what more do we need to go hit more do we need to be in the weight room um or and there's those you know social media posts that are kind of the making fun of oh i don't want to get in the car with my dad after a bad game or mm-hmm. i'm scared to what my mom's going to say after i struck out three times but my parents 
Um, I never had that experience with them. They were always so proud of me and the effort and the attitude that I had. Um, and they always made that really clear and just the support and this, like the taught of, like I said, self-reliance, um, was super cool for me. Yeah. That's really cool cool to say they were always so proud of me. And then you mentioned two things there, the effort that I had and the attitude that I had. Cause I'm sure growing up, you lost some games. You had bad games like everybody else. Yeah. Oh, how did they react when you had a bad game? And they would be just as, just as supportive for a bad game as they, as it was for the best tournament ever. You know, yeah. if you go, go and go you know, eight for eight, six doubles. I remember that weekend that I played in that like specific tournament. And that w- those were my stats that it was just like, I was hitting the ball really well um, compared to another one when things just didn't go my way. Um, and the same thing, it's just a hug after the tournament or hug between games and like keep working hard you got it. And so there was never that fear of, oh man, like what wrath am I going to get from my parents? Cause I knew they were sacrificing time and money for me to be able to play and have these opportunities. But, um, they always were supportive no matter what. And I'm super thankful for that. Sounds like you have great parents. Yeah, I do for sure. That, that's awesome. So take me to the coaches. If I, if someone were to tell you, Hey, Peyton, you played for a perennial power in high school softball, the best team in the state. I think that's without question. Spanish Fork is the best softball program in the state. Yeah. What made it that? What what was it about the Spanish Fork softball community that produces just state champion after state champion after state champion, you know? Yeah. Um, so I had a the opportunity, like you said, to play for Spanish Fork. So I played for Don Andrews, Natalie Jarvis, and Jimmy Andrews for the course of my high school career. And the thing that I didn't realize, like I said before, was the real dedication and preparation that it takes even before you get to practice and you get to the game. Um, I remember showing up to practice every single day and don would have his little notebook he'd flip it open as like this little one and and he would have the drills down the groups that were going to the certain drills and it was down to the minute that it was always a very productive practice and um he was a tough coach in games um there were you know times when we did get yelled at we got corrected on the field but he always backed it up with how he could help us um we he always came to practice the next day with the specific things that would make us better for moving forward say that we just all went over on the rise ball from springville and we came back the next day and he was out there pitching to every single one of us and throwing rise balls and mixing it up. And, and just that preparation, the dedication that to now as a coach that I, I'm not the one that really thrives on showing up and what should we do today? It's after the last game, after last tournament, after practice. Okay. How did those things go? What specific things can my athletes benefit from? How can I help them with this struggle um and one of the little not pep talks that don gave us was before he sometimes he'd say if you need a pep talk you're in trouble um but a quote that has stuck with me all the time is there's no such thing as luck luck is when preparation meets opportunity so he gave us that preparation those coaches prepared us for those opportunities to then take it, like you said, deep in the playoffs to win state championships, um, to play and compete against good softball squads. Yeah. That's, that's really cool to think of a coach 
you know, like you're a teacher now and the best teachers go into their lessons and they've, they've really planned, like, here's what my students need. Here's what they're struggling with. I know from their last test, you know, that this is what they need help with. I need to help them understand this concept. And so they plan, here's what I need to do to really help them. And sometimes when we get into the sports realm, we forget that coaches at the heart of a coach, they're a teacher. And so almost coming up with a lesson plan instead of just a, we're going to go out and hit balls because that's what softball players do. Mm -hmm. They get very, very specific. You know, the other day I was talking to someone about giving feedback and I remember for me, when I went from high school to college, I had great high school coaches. I played for a great program in Southern California as well. But college took it to a different level because those coaches were paid to be there, you know, <laughs> like they were, uh, it was more than the love of the game that was getting them there, though that was the main yeah. part of it. I remember a coach telling me, Shad, you're going to be a good baseball player until you could drive the ball to right field. And I, I was a right-handed hitter. And he taught me that I was hitting the ball to like too I don't know, like too forward in my stance to yeah. right field that I should let the ball travel and hit it off my back knee and that I was lunging to the ball. And that's why I was never hitting with power to right field. And I remember him taking a tee and setting up a tee on my back right leg outside corner and just having me drive the ball, I mean, hundreds of swings into a net. And this is over weeks. And then he sat there in the cage and he sat on a stool. He was an older coach and he sat there on a ball bucket, actually. And he was sitting there watching the ball and he was having the pitcher throw it on the outside corner. And and he was just watching where I made contact, you know, just watching where I made contact. And he'd be like... Yeah. Nope, you lunged. Nope, you lunged. You know, hit it off your back knee. And when I would do it, man, he would celebrate like I just won the championship, you know. And yeah. and and I think that what you were saying there is you were talking about your coaches and their planning and the rise ball and that it seems that great coaches and parents who want to help their their kids, that they go in with a plan. Yeah. And that there's positivity to it. You know, we're going to yeah. get better. There's grit. Um, my brother, who's a, he's a beha- doctor of behavioral health, but he talks about grit a lot that he's, he just defines grit in two words. And that's not yet. Like when yeah. someone's trying to improve the feedback you give them, that was pretty good. Not yet though. We, you know, we got more we yeah. got more that we could do. Not yet. Let's keep going. Keep going. And that keeps it positive. And sounds like that existed a lot at Spanish Fork High School. Yeah, for sure. There was always like a purpose between behind the drills. And that now it makes, like I said, more sense. It's kind of hindsight, you know, it's 2020, but athletes just appreciate the practices that your coaches are planning for you. And that yeah. the drills are for a reason. Um, and that as a coach, sometimes that I incorporate one drill that is like specific for one or two athletes that they're lunging with their front leg, right. Mm -hmm. That we kind of do that, but it can still be beneficial for everyone too. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. What advice would you give a young person who wants to be great at sports? Um, or anything. Yeah, anything. Just whatever you do, do it wholeheartedly. And I love, and you guys have used this word several times, being really intentional. Um, Just really putting your mind to whatever it is and that you should strive to be the best at whatever it is that you're wanting to be. whether that's in school or in sports or in a career, um, that you are dedicating that chunk of time to being the best, whatever you need to do to do that. 
Awesome. Yeah, we actually like saying, um, strive to be your best, not the best. And the reason why we say that, you've probably heard us say that, you've been part of our program yeah. for a long time, <laughs> um, is because I actually think when sometimes people put a ceiling on themselves, right? Like, uh, we have such a limited scope um, for example, if you were like, all right, I want to be the best outfielder in Spanish Fork. And it's like, well, that's great. But what if you could be the best outfielder, softball outfielder in the state of yeah. Utah? What if you could be the best in the country? What if you could make the Olympic softball team? You know, and, yeah. and sometimes people stop working because mm -hmm. they were gifted. And especially, it, I think... 13, 14, 15, those are the most dangerous athletic years. And the reason is, is because people grow at different rates. There are different ages, you know, like I have a daughter right now who's by far the youngest in her grade, it seems. I mean, July 24th birthday. And so she's always the smallest, the, you know. So right now, you know, in the ninth and 10th grade years, she's smaller than everyone. And there are, there are, kids who've grown and because of genetics, they just shoot up a little faster. And I, I fear that kids become content with being currently the best. And they mm -hmm. don't realize that a lot of that came just because they shot up before everyone else, or they're a little yeah. older and they don't put in that intentional work to continue to be good. And yeah. then all of a sudden people start passing them up and they wonder, well, what's wrong? And it's like, you stopped working. You yeah. you weren't given intentional effort to be the best that you could be. And uh, not necessarily the best, but the best that you could be. You settled for being yeah. being the best, to, you know, on your team or whatever it might be. And so, so that's great. That's awesome. You know, we talk a lot about the principle of win the hour. Yeah. And, and when you're in a moment, to use that moment to get the most out of whatever it is that you're doing. What would, how would you talk about win the hour when it comes to what you just taught us about being intentional about your growth? Yeah, we, um, it's actually what we're focusing on this month with our leadership council here at Dixie high school. And we're having a discussion on it. And I brought up the fact that there's studies that have um, been done that have showed that these pivotal years in while well, they're in school, these kids that it's actually blocked off to like the most productive that you can be. That when you are from 815 to 935, you are in biology and you are focusing on biology, right? And then the bell rings and then you're switching your mentality to English or math or yoga, whatever it is that you dedicate those time, those hours to where you are. You're not thinking of what's happened in fourth period or after practice or on Friday night that you're really like intentional in those um, blocks of time that you have set off. And that's something that we can do for all of us, all the rest of our lives too. Yeah. Boy, it kills me, Peyton. Like it kills me to see how many kids right now are totally impacting their future because of their stupid phone. Yeah. Oh yeah. For you know, sure. like there are kids who haven't attended a math class this year. I mean, they've been at present, but they haven't, they haven't won the hour in math one time. And then they're getting behind and they're impacting their future just to scroll through stupid videos or just yep. to play a game, you know, a, a video game. And I, you're, so you're both a, a teacher and a, a coach and a former athlete and what would you say about cell phones in particular when it comes to becoming your best self winning the hour do you have any thoughts on that from a teacher's perspective yeah i see it all day every day in my life and and something that i i lead the year off with um with the kids is like i know how it is to have a phone i have my phone i went through school with the phone i don't know that i'm necessarily as glued to it as they are just over the last um i think dustin's called them the iGen or yeah that but 
the rule in my classroom is there's going to be a time and a place to use your phones. There's, and like when I'm lecturing or someone else is sharing, like it, it's, it's off and it's away. And if it can't be used properly, then it, there are consequences with that. And so it's kind of that balance of, okay, we know we're always going to have this with us. There's always going to be those notifications, those things, but it's kind of realizing and learning how to manage that. Like you said, there's kids who have been in class, but not really been there. Um, yeah. And it's frustrating because you know that that's how they're going to be in the next class and the next class. Um, and it's, it's a fight that a lot of, I would say almost all teachers are really battling now um, with sports. It's your phone stays in the clubhouse. You don't wear your Apple watch. It stays in the clubhouse. You get it afterwards um, where I hope that those student athletes are learning that a little bit faster that it's like, Hey, I, I didn't need it for three hours, two hours, whatever it is. I didn't, I didn't die not checking my notifications, not seeing someone, whatever so-and-so is doing on Snapchat. Yeah. Um, kind yeah. Of. So what would you want parents to know as a high school teacher? If you had like all the parents of your kids in front of you and you were just going to say a few sentences on phones, what advice would you give to parents? Oh, um, that one's tough because there are so many different like beliefs on it, yeah. but I, there's been, there was a teacher who got every single one of the phones and, and I think the parents are in the same situation too. Turned on all the notifications, set the, so like sound on, vibrate on, put them on the table and then sat there for five minutes and tallied up the notifications that this is what's taking your child or even as parents is taking that time away from what you are supposed to be spending that time on um, that you need to again teach your kids that there's a time and a place to use this um, and to make them be present where they are yeah i when i was a young parent so you're right now just barely almost ready to have a baby right so so here's parental advice that second generation advice that came from a great parent that i admired to me now i'm passing it to you peyton and everybody's listening yeah. no, but she <laughs> said she would always tell her children i love you enough to let you hate me for a little while yeah <laughs> and and uh another very wise um mentor that I consider a mentor. He said one time, second, only to your love, your children need your limits. And I, I see those kids who live in a limitless society who just are able to do whatever they want, whenever they want. Our kids need our limits, right? They need, and it's okay, place limits. And if they hate us for a little while, that's okay. Like that's totally okay. As a parent, we're not supposed to be their best friend. As a teacher, we're not trying to be their best friend. As a coach, we're not trying to be their best friend. We need to love them enough to let them be, hate us for a while is how she said it, but, but, or at least be displeased with us for a little while. They need, yeah. they need our limits. And I'm just, I'm crushed when I see the number of kids that are totally compromising their future just because they can't stay away from a phone. I, I think there's kids right now in our society that are growing up and having a life that they wouldn't have had if they were born 20 years earlier and right. just because they don't have the distraction. And so, yeah, thanks for, thanks for talking about that. So now Peyton, I mentioned this in the, in the intro, but you were actually a student athlete that we awarded with the Eyes Up Scholarship because of the impact that you had on your community, on your team, on your school. And so I would love to talk with you just about the advice that you would give a young person who wants to use their position as an athlete to help and lift those around them. What advice would you give in regard to keeping your eyes up and doing the work? Yeah, um, one of my all-time favorite quotes is, 
be somebody who makes everybody feel like a somebody. So that's what I strive to do as a person, as a teacher, as a coach, that I hope I accomplished as a teammate and a friend that every single person is important and to be that person that makes them feel that way. Um, to just really reach out. I, my first year as head coach um, really hit me hard because about two weeks before tryouts, I got a call from a mom that one of my incoming players had a suicide attempt. And it's a, uh, just really switched things around for me um and really put things into perspective of the hard times that a lot of these kids are going through and i unless you know her mom would have filled me in on it wouldn't have necessarily known that she was in that dark place because a lot of these students these athletes these kids put on a really good front I guess um and that that was something you know as a teacher I know of there's certain kids out there that need a little more love than others um that you know of some might you not know of but that's if everybody was living to make somebody feel important really looking out for the needs of others then it really can make the world a better place and that's why i'm so passionate about especially for athletes and what it's really teaching kids just to reach out you know look outwards there's so many kids who don't get their names read over the intercom um, or the you know the pa that hey this team won so and so scored this many points um but there's kids every day that don't feel recognized. They don't feel important. Um, that they'll never have their name up in lights kind of thing. Uh, but there's somebody in their class that could make them feel that important just by the way that they treat them. Yeah. What did it do for you when it clicked for you? Because you're obviously someone I know who wins those scholarships and you're obviously someone who exemplified this in high school. I'm curious, not just what it did for other people, which obviously that's why we do it, right? Um, to lift and help those around us. But what did it do for you to intentionally live with your eyes up, looking for people who might need some help, need to be noticed, valued, recognized, and then doing the work to to show them that they're valued, to include them in things, to invite them to things. What did that do for you throughout high school? Yeah, this um, concept really clicked, I think, my senior year, because I was someone who had teams around me. I had great friends and support systems. Um, and there were a couple things in my personal life that just didn't go the way that I thought they were going to go. And I was really struggling with these things. Um, and then I had lost my cousin in a tragic car accident. And and I did, still to this day don't know who it was, um, but someone had written me an anonymous note, left it on like my desk where I had sat in, it was seminary class, but it was that Peyton, you are a light to others. And it was a, sorry, I'm like getting kind of emotional about this, but it was a time when I didn't feel that my light was very bright, that I was feeling really dull. Um, but that's when it really clicked for me that like, hey, someone, someone had their eyes up, they did something about this. And it changed my day still, eight, what, seven, eight years later, I remember that. So hmm. it was pretty cool. And that made you want to do that for others? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, Peyton, thank you for sharing that. 
Yeah, of course. A simple thing, a little note, you know, sometimes we we think we have to do some big thing and feed all the hungry in Africa and, yeah. you know, and of course we try to do those big things too, but yeah. sometimes it's just those little, little things that make a huge impact yeah. on others. There's, and there's people just around us every day who might need that, so... Well, Peyton, thank you so much for taking the time today to yeah, be with us on the Sportlight Podcast. We appreciate your example all through being a player and now being a coach. And you're you're a great strength to our program and a great example of the principles that we that we t- try so hard to get into the hearts of young people. And you're doing that as you lead the leadership council there at, at Dixie High in St. George, Utah, and. We appreciate so much your example and the insights that you've shared, and we wish you just the best of of luck and health and safety as as you bring that little girl into the world here coming up, and and what a blessing it is for her to have someone like you as a mom. So, so thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, of course. All right, everybody, thank you for joining the Sportlight Podcast. Like it and share it with others. And as always, keep your eyes up and do the work. This has been the Sportlight Podcast from Especially for Athletes, sponsored by Coca-Cola. You can learn more about Especially for Athletes by visiting the website at especiallyforathletes.org. You can also learn more about the book, The Sportlight, by Shad Martin and Dustin Smith at especiallyforathletes.org slash book.